we're off to a good start. Um, officially five. It is officially five, so I'll call this meeting to order. Um, first order of business, can we um, have a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting? Move to approve. take this in the public comment section. The mayor asked me if I could move something to the top of the agenda. So, mayor, would you like to come first? On well, this? if you want to do public comment, you could do that, or if you, I don't know how you're planning to do it. Okay, is there anyone here for public comment? Yes. Is that in general or to a specific It's general, issue? but you know, in this, we're, we're running this much more informally, and if you want to wait until we certainly will recognize you during the uh, Thank you. the specific issue. I'd be glad to do that. So, so Mayor, you want to? Okay. So I'm uh, back before you as a follow-on to the conversation we had at our last meeting, uh, and this was with regard to uh, my request for your sponsorship, uh, co-sponsorship with me of a um, request to City Council for a tax increment financing um, resolution or TIF. Um, and as I think I described to you last time, uh, this was for the uh, Grantham Group uh, for Christopher Heights project proposed at um, Village Hill. And uh, what I was proposing uh, to do was to offer a 25% TIF over 15 years and then and, and simultaneously uh, with Christopher Heights, a request was made to the CPA committee for $120,000, which was approved, which would help to underwrite in some way although not directly, but it would serve to underwrite the TIF or defray the cost of the TIF. Um, and I presented that information to you. I know that the committee was divided last time, actually evenly divided on the question. And so in reporting that back to um, Walter Ohanian, who's the managing director uh, for uh, Grantham Group and the Christopher Heights Project, he asked if he could have the opportunity to come before you and answer and make a presentation and answer any questions that people had about it um, that I may not have been able to answer. So I would like to introduce you to Walter Ohanian um, from the Grantham Group and give him an opportunity to, to follow up on the conversation we had last time. Great. I just was remiss on one little detail. We took this out of order because the only other agenda item, which will take quite a while, will be the next item. And that's why I, I didn't say that. We took this out of order in terms of our agenda. So now, come on. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to be able to speak to you today. What I'd like to do, if it's okay with your permission, is to go over the highlights of the project and to show you a little bit about it, if that's okay? Great. So, can I come around to the side? Sure. Okay, great. All right. So, what are we proposing to do? Christopher Heights Assisted Living is an 83-unit assisted living community. 43 of those 83 units will be dedicated to low-income seniors. And those are residents who earn less than 60% of the area median income. Out of those 43, 17 will be dedicated to residents who earn less than 30% of the area median income. <clears throat> what type of resident moves into an assisted living? What's the difference between being independent at home and, and moving into an assisted living. The typical resident that comes to see me is typically in their mid-80s, and something's happened. They might have had a fall at home. They might not be taking their meds appropriately at home any longer. They're concerned that they've isolated themselves and are unable to maintain their independence being alone in the house 24 hours a day. So they would look at the option of coming to an assisted living community. What types of things do we provide? We provide personal care services, and that those are helps with bathing, dressing, medication reminders. We provide three meals a day, housekeeping, laundry, linen, a full activities program. We have 24-hour awake staff on site. Those staff members are certified <coughs> nursing assistants or home health aides, and they help give care to the resident. We call them companions. They actually see the residents all the time throughout the day. In addition to that, we have a nurse that's on staff. The nurse is on staff eight hours a day, seven days a week. If the resident isn't feeling well, she'll go down and see what's happening with the resident. Then she'll call the family and she'll talk it over with the resident. 
this is what's going on. I think things are okay. Let's give it a couple days and see how things go. Well, you know what? I think we should make a call to the primary care physician and find out exactly, have you seen, to you, so you know exactly what's going on. So someone is with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Be it, you have the privacy of your own apartment. In a nursing home, you have skilled nursing services that are there. It's for a, someone who needs more acute care services. In the assisted living, you decorate the apartment like you would your own home. You bring in all your own furniture, and it's your own individual apartment. The nice thing about what, we're what we are proposing here is in many assisted livings in Massachusetts, they're 100% market rate, which means you're paying from your assets to be able to support for you to be here. There's very little state funding that's available for people to be able to live in assisted living. There are very select few assisted livings that have state funding availability that tap into people who are on the Medicaid program. Our assisted living, what we're proposing, actually does accept the Medicaid program. The good news is, let's say you come in and you were market rate. And let's say you were living in a nice one-bedroom apartment. When your funds run out, you never have to leave. Let's say you came in from off the street and you didn't have the funds to be able to pay for assisted living services. The nice thing is you can still live in one beautiful one-bedroom apartment. We take away the fear of being able to afford assisted living services. So I'd like to show you where it is on Village Hill, if that's okay. So if you're coming up Village Hill Drive, this is Moser, Sheet, Moser Street and this is Musante Street. When you're coming up Village Hill Drive, this is the male attendance building. This is what the building's going to look like. It will be a circular entrance that you'll have. Just to kind of give you some elevations as to what the building will be, it's going to have some brick that will be on the first floor, as well as some siding that will be on the upper floors as well. It'll be a very attractive building. Approximately 58,000 square feet will be three <coughs> stories. This is what it's going to look like from the entrance, and then this is what it's going to look like from Moser Street. of how it's going to look from Asante Street. And as you can see, there will be brick that will also go up, just to kind of give the building some depth as well. So it will be a very attractive building that will fit in nicely with the property itself. Just to kind of give you an idea of the inside of the building, I just want to pass around a couple pictures if you don't mind. Over here, You can pass those around. What I'm showing you is a country kitchen type of setting. So when you move into the assisted living, we have country kitchens that are located on the different floors. So if you're the new resident moving in, that's where your meals are. The nice thing about our type of assisted living is there's not a main dining room. So if you're the new resident moving in, you're the 83rd person moving in, you don't have 83 heads turning to see, who you're, to see who's coming. You're eating with the people that are on your floor, in your neighborhood. As we grew up, and as our residents have grown up, they didn't want to eat every night. So to have it in an attractive style type of dining room, I think is nice. As well as you can see from the pictures, is a nice fireplace living room. Old Victorian style. You walk into the building, we try and make it like a bed and breakfast. So you'll be able to see, you'll see residents, nice blue carpet, rich red couches, the fireplace going, activities that are happening there. It's a very social environment in that aspect. There's also a pub that's there, it's a coffee bar where we have a morning exercise program, to where you might hold something, could be a, a musical <coughs> entertainment, could be bingo, could also be a, uh, a coffee hour in the morning, a chance for residents to kind of come out into a common area, and I think those are the nice things. This here, we talk about the affordability of Christopher Heights, and what does that really, what does that really mean? Well, if you were to go to our website today, one of the things you'll see in our building is something that we call no worries pricing. You never have to worry about running out of money at Christopher Heights. This here is an ad that we run. Something that the family members get, it's something that's up, that's up in the conference room. When you come in, these are the services you're going to get, and you never have to fear of worrying about where the financial resources are. So we're providing 43 low-income units. 
One of the ways we're able to do that is through the tax credits. As the mayor has probably explained to you, we've applied for low-income housing tax credits. It's a very expensive operational budget to run. And why are we applying for this? Act? The reason why is it is, like I had said, an expensive operation to be able to have 24 hours a day staff on board in being able to provide the services that we provide. <coughs> What I'd like to do is just to give you some economic facts about the project and the reasons why I think a TIF would be in order. The project's going to create a minimum of 40 permanent jobs. Over the course of 15 years, the estimated payroll will be in excess of $12 million over those 15 years. Let's say the investment of the TIF, let's say it comes in at $200,000. That's a 6,000% return for what we're offering. Our experience shows we have four other communities, Worcester, Webster, Attleboro, and Marlboro, that many of these jobs are filled locally. The employees that work for us are also expanding your tax base. They could be living in Northampton and also spending their money in Northampton. The project's going to make purchases from local vendors for food, maintenance repairs, landscaping, snow removal, entertainment, transportation, advertising, office supplies, administrative expenses. Over the course of 15 years, based on our history of doing these, about $2.3 million. This is a $13.4 million project. 8.8 in construction spending. That will be built in the course of about 12 months. During that time, it's going to generate approximately 65 construction jobs. In addition to that, many of the construction workers will be tradesmen most likely will be locally as well. I understand that as an elected official, your obligation is to have the taxpayers in Northampton and to, and, to, and to work for them. It's hard to argue the economic benefits of the project and what it brings to the city. So that's why I'm here before you today, to explain a little bit about pro our project, what we offer, and the reasons why I think the tip we're asking for is in order. So questions? I'll just get my apologies, but uh, if you could, um, if you could just remind me exactly what the tip is that's on the table. Right now. The tip on the table um, is a. Mayor, do you want to go through that again? Oh, did you just exactly. present? Oh my God. No, no, it's oh, it's so what sorry. I presented at the last yeah, meeting. So it would be a 25 percent tip over 15 years. But as we showed on the chart, I think I, I gave everyone this chart last yes. time. Okay, got it. What we tried to do was, again, off to. The in a separate venue, we've applied for CPA funding, and the idea was to try to treat that that CPA funding to help supplement the tip. So, what we were what we were generally showing was that the value of the um, of of the TIF, our standard TIF is five percent. Right. That's what we've given people on a standard basis, and so the CPA C money or CPA money was meant to defray the other twenty percent. Obviously, it's a rough calculation done using today's numbers, uh, and so, but that's that's what we were trying to achieve as okay. a way to get credit for the affordability component, which the CPA was very supportive of, but also uh, Mr. Ohanian's desire to have those operational expenses over 15 years um, be more uh, easier for him to predict. If you will. So I just wanted to make sure we were where we left off. So we're exactly where okay. we left off. It's just Thank I, I, the committee didn't want to make a clear recommendation at that time. The, the <clears throat> committee was divided. And when I reported that back to Mr. O'Haney, and he asked for the opportunity <clears throat> to come before the committee and just see if he could provide any additional information. Thank um, you. So. I just had to get reminded that just why a, I Another point of information there. Do you happen to have what, or perhaps you do, the, what the the amount that the state will then be giving in tax breaks on this project and over what period of time? Well, the, the um, I, I'll, I'll let Walter speak to the low-income tax sure. credits. In terms of the other incentives, this would really be a local TIF. This would be a local only so TIF. So it would not be matched since the state is already giving other credits, there would not be additional, whether this TIF comes through or not. With the state. Yeah. Yeah. We're applying for low-income housing tax credits. It's a federal program 
that the tax credits you get. I from understand. Them. Okay. Normally, when we we have a tip, this, the the main benefit of the tip is not the local tax break. Yeah. From the it's tip. a it's the another main state, benefit yeah. by far is the state tax break. Right. Is there any additional state? Okay. So this no, would no. just be the local money. Exactly. Right. Okay. And we do have the option. We still have to go through a state process, and still the project still has to be certified yeah. by a committee. Um, even to approve a local only TIF. Um, so we still have to apply through it. But you're right, in the past, we've done a 5% TIF somewhat symbolically to, to allow a company to get into the queue for more state incentives. One last question. Yep. If this was not to pass to give the TIF, would the CPA, was there any talk of the CPA providing funds separate from this TIF to the project? So the CPC did approve uh, funding under the arrangement that we described. So currently the order that they approved was that this funding would be, uh, you know, sort of tied to the TIF. If so was, if, if it didn't happen, we'd have to go back to them to reapply under a might different scenario. There might not be an application to the CPC for, for <coughs> funds just directly, separate from the TIF if the TIF didn't happen. That would be a, another we'd have to... Yeah, but clearly what they agreed to this time was contingent on this other TIF application. Okay, so, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. And when did the CPA approve this? Uh, the CPC had CPC, a me me. meeting. I think it was December. Uh, December or early January. January. Yeah, January. I can't remember. Uh, the, uh, uh, went before them um, and, and uh, got permission to seek to apply and applied and had a similar conversation. And so a recommendation was approved, um, which then comes to me. I wasn't going to bring it forward to the council unless this other piece, you know, the TIF piece. If it doesn't happen, then I would just go back to the CPC and say, it's a, you know, we can't move forward so without the TIF part of it. So, so the 25% the TIF and is being, you'd call it being underwritten by $125,000 for CPA. 120. 120. Yes. Yeah. Rough. Yeah, it's 120. And I think as I showed you the, um, as I showed you the breakdown before, um, it roughly worked out to be about 100, 119.8 was yeah. the was the 20 percent portion of the 25 percent tip. Again, a static number yeah. times you know taking the 1426 tax rate. And, and bringing it out 15 years, so uh, that's that was the calculation. Because obviously we can't, we have no way of predicting what the values will be or what the tax rate will be or whatever. The only thing I wanted to just reemphasize, which I reemphasized again, is you know right now this is a property that's generating no tax, no taxes. Uh, it's not generating any property taxes because it's owned by mass development, and it's also sorry. That's a teenager. <laughs> I can't her back. Um, and that particular context yes. on my phone too. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, and also, uh, you know, it's certainly not generating any income at this point. So, you know, that I just I throw that out there because right now we're making zero tax dollars on the project. We want to see the project happen. I think this is a good use because assisted living has been identified back in the first master plan as a as a suitable use um, on Village Hill. So, and a question I guess I would have is: Is there a big need for it in this community? Is there? Do you see that? Yeah, we did a market study, and absolutely, there is there is a large need for it, especially the affordability component of it, because there are not once once again there are not many assisted livings that will take in someone who doesn't have the assets to be able to pay for assisted living services privately. And ours will have the Medicaid reimbursement, so we'll be able to take in those residents and use Medicaid funds to be able to pay for the services. And the, and the nice thing about our community is even some of the assisted livings that do take in residents under Medicaid <coughs> is they either will have them go to a unit that's less desirable, meaning smaller, or what they'll do is they'll put two people in a unit, and our company doesn't do either. You'll stay in the unit that you're in, in addition to that, you will not double up. There will not be two, two unrelated parties in a room, unless it was a husband and wife or two sisters or someone that wanted to live together. But that would be their choice, not us forcing upon them to do that. I think the low-income component of it is, is something that's swayed and supported. It's 43 units. It's more than half of the building. And that's, that's, that's the uniqueness of this. 
once again, if there are some assisted livings that do have that do have it, and there are few, I, to be honest with you, there's about 200 assisted livings in Massachusetts. Not many have the Medicaid component. If they do, it might be five units, might be ten units. Ours is over half the building, 43 units. One more, Sean. If you touched on it a little bit. Explain the no worries. Pricing. Pricing. Sure. Just yep. For you to pay privately into an assisted living, besides your income, you're also using your assets. When your assets run out, who's going to pay for that? It's either your family or you're going to have to move out. In our assisted living, well, that's great. We actually have loan communities that are available. You can stay in that building. So you never have to worry about trying to come up with the funds to be able to support assisted living. Because we get reimbursed from the state for services. So you would start out using your own assets? You could, okay, or right. you could come in off the street. Let's say you don't have anything. All you have is your monthly income. You could still come into Christopher Heights and live that way, whether that's at Christopher Heights in Northampton, hopefully someday, or also the four other projects that we manage. I just, and I just want to add one more fact, if I could, and this is just this is coming from the CPA side of it, because I know, you know, we're talking about the costs on the CPA side, the 120,000. We're talking about the potential costs on the tax benefit side. Again, um, this, so so far the CPA has has created 39 affordable units in the city since its existence, and at a cost of. Uh, one point one four five million dollars, or twenty nine thousand, a little over twenty nine thousand per unit. This is going to create forty three units um, for one hundred twenty thousand, which is about two thousand eight hundred dollars per unit. So, even if you take just the it, it, just putting a, a CPC and then any additional that we may pay through the TIF, because it's an inexact science in trying to spec it out over 15 years, we're still, in terms of getting bang for our buck, in terms of what we're trying to create here, where this will be uh, you know, more units than we've created to date, and at a far more cost-effective rate, so. Thank you. Um, Mr. Haynes, I appreciate your coming in. Um, Thank you for having me. Uh, but, uh, your, you know, your points are are, uh, are well taken, um, but we also have to be cognizant that uh, the, the city is not just in the business of, of helping foster a positive economic environment uh, and also trying to watch out for its most needy, uh, but also to manage risk. Uh, and I, I, my biggest objection to the 15-year TIF is, is risk. So I'm. I'm going to. I'm asking you. I'm going to ask you a question that um, sounds going to sound a little funky, but this is what we asked the mayor last time, and sure. he really couldn't answer. And the question is, why is it that Christopher Heights needs a 15-year tip? Uh, what about a five-year tip sure. of, a, of a much larger right. percentage, but that, but then dwindled yeah. after the fifth year? Because I'm looking at this from a risk management perspective. Right. Okay. Th this building is going to be low income in perpetuity. We have a, when we, when we get awarded, if we get awarded the loan housing tax credits, we, when we file the application, that's what we honored. So this building is going to have, it's going to be low income. So I have to make sure that I can be able to afford to pay the taxes, the employees, the food costs, over the course of the longevity of the project. During the first 15 years is when the tax credits are the most important. So the person who invests in the tax credits, they get the benefit the first 10 years. Then, there's a five years, then, there, then there is a five years compliance period before the tax credit investor has no, no risk any longer, so to say. I need to make sure for the first 15 years that, I need to make sure forever that the building's financially viable. In particular, the first 15 years with those credits, I have to make sure that I can pay all the expenses that go into the building, the mortgage, the real estate taxes, the employees, the raw food. We have buildings that have been in existence for 17 years. And when you walk into them today, they still look like the day that they opened. We continue to sink money back into our buildings. We put additions onto our buildings. We have <coughs> added um, more low-income units than what we obliga were obligated to, to do. There could be times where I am 45 or 46 low-income units. Because let's say I had a market rate resident who ran out of money. 
and they were, they, they were maybe on the wait list to go to low income. I don't just say, well, either you continue to pay privately until one opens up, we just accept it and we'll become 44 low income units for that time, or 45 low income units for that time. So we are a very high fixed cost business. And so I have to make sure, just like any, any business person is going to do or any businesses, you can continue to pay what you need to to make sure you have viability for that. So there's a risk for us as well. So this is this relates to low income housing credits. Correct. Which are which is a public private partnership. Correct. So can I just say yeah, one sure. yeah. I, I was probably um, the, the I was probably one of the people that made up the divided the divided uh, That's okay. debate from last time. Sure. And uh, um, after afterwards I did a little some sketches on my um, computer. Yep. And uh, What I what I see is um, Northampton has a uh, has a um, pension for it raising its property tax, okay. uh, not just through overrides, but regularly every year when it sets its tax rate, usually okay. at a two and a half percent rate. And so, as the years go out, it gets worse and worse when with a percent. Uh, it gets worse for the city. Sure. Obviously, better for the uh, for the enterprise, um, so so for example, a twenty five percent TIF. This is this is for my fellow council's benefit. Just as an example, if we just assume just two and a half percent increases for the, for the next fifteen years, no overrides, no 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 reassessments or anything like that, just two and a half percent increases. A uh, twenty five percent TIF by the fifteenth year would um, obligate the city. To roughly 11 percent, and the CPA to 14. Whereas the CPA starts at 20, and the city at five. The city's now making up the difference, but an, an additional an, an additional difference. So, what I'm as the time draws out, right. the, the risk to the city so, increases. Yeah. So this is the this is the part which which concerns me, and um, I I'd like to see. A five-year, or a ten-year, or a seven-year, some TIF that is not the fifteen years right. at that high percent. Mayor, you wanted to address that. The other thing I wanted to say is that it's it's a little um, uh, it's it's a little bit of an oversimplification to say that tax everyone's tax bill goes up two and a half percent every year. We because we're not allowed the you know the overall value. It's a it, the numbers are in sync. The overall like we're not allowed to increase the overall values of our total property in the city every year. So some of the tax rate setting is based on valuations, and so the two kind of move in sync. So I don't think that you, it's I don't know that you can accurately say okay, just take the number and increase it two and a half percent every year, and this is where we'll be. Because what could happen is the value. You know, the tax rate could go up to 1472, but the valuation of his particular property could go down because the values are constantly moving. So, I, but I understand what you're saying, and I concede the point that it's an inexact. You know, this 15 year we were sketching out, and we said it admittedly, it's a it's sort of a simplified static model. Um, I get that, but I also just want to be clear that that your model is also not not a hundred percent either because you really you can't calculate it that way. I think my yeah yeah. I just want to say I think my model's um, as conservative. Okay. In a different way. I mean. Okay. I if anyone's if anyone here owns commercial property, I dare them to tell me that 15 years ago it is it was valued the same or le or more than it's valued now. Well, this is actually tax. Well, it's fine. It's residential. This will be on the residential. Right. But it's even better. Yeah. So um, home values in 1995 in, in Northampton are much lower than what they are today. And so I, I do believe that uh, the city is taking on significant risk with a 15 year term. The, the, the hope is that you see significant value in it as well. It, it's the job creation, it's the spending that we're going to be doing, it's the payroll that we have within the community, it, it's also the goods and services that we're going to be doing to the local vendors as well. So there is a give and take, and I, and I completely understand that. But I think on our end, too, is what we're, you know, besides what we're spending in the job creation, it's also, it's disheartening to see 
in some assisted livings, well, mom has spent X amount of dollars here. Where do we go? Well, then that's, that's when I sometimes get the phone call saying, okay, mom spent $100,000 in ABC assisted living. She's run out. They're telling her either we have to pay, which we can't as the children, or she's going to have to either go to a nursing home that will accept Medicaid money across the state, or Walter, can you take it? I've gotten those calls okay. before. So I'm hoping there's a value for the, for, for the seniors as well of, of the community. I think we understand, We all understand both the value of the sure. project and the economic value. I do want to say, did you look at the actual hard numbers when you did this and how much it's costing the city? Because when we talk about risk to the city and we look at the actual value in dollar terms, do you have that dollar terms we're talking about if it went up to the 11%? Yes, you, using, and, of course, my... And how much my, would it be uh, for in a year if it went up to that 11%? Well, I can give you, I'll give you a couple different ways. Um, if the city's uh, the city stayed um, um, the the total uh, tax paid after 15 years is, would be what was I want the one year if it went up to 11 percent you you were using a, a a model that said here's the percentage right what are you coming out with in terms of the amount which that, that, that the city the city would then be, would be before be, the city would lose that's four, right what would the, the city, city would lose another four thousand dollars okay so the city would lose another four thousand dollars to me that is not a very high risk talking about four thousand dollars for projects so i just want to talk here a second about values and what both the federal and state government have done <coughs> over the last 20 30 years that's that projects like this have not despite what you're hearing the amount of money going into these projects, the amount of money that we have put into what we claim we value has gone down and down and down relative to other things. And therefore, part of this is what do we value? When we talk about, you, you just talked about a high risk of the city, and then you say it's $4,000 for that year that we're losing. It, it, you know, to me, it's are we going to be, and, and unfortunately we're the place where this is, the, the buck is stopping now. Where the, because federal government, which used to take a huge portion of this when, when I was a lot younger, the federal government is pulling out of this kind of, of business, or at least giving a lot less to it. And the question becomes, are communities going to take responsibility? Having had two parents, both of whom were in assisted living, okay, watching them use up their life savings in assisted living, <clears throat> watching my mother then have to leave assisted living and going into a nursing home, and it was you know, heartbreaking to watch that happen and to not even have a kind of decent unit. I would have rather they were able to stay in Northampton, which they weren't. Um, and the other thing that's also happening when we talk about need, we're talking about our generation, the baby boomers, the amount of people who are not prepared for retirement in any way, shape, or form, and everybody will tell you that. And we're moving in to that age group where soon we will be in that average in the 80s. We're going to need this. I think there's going to be an overwhelming need. This. So, uh, yes, is there some risk that the amount of money is going to be somewhat greater? Yes, but when you throw out four thousand or even ten thousand dollars, yes, okay. The difference that's that's on a conservative estimate. Number one. Number two, if you're going to talk about value, the total city on my projections, if the city just has a five gets a five percent tip for fifteen years, the total tax saved or the total amount that the city <coughs> grants as a as a Financing option is thirty six, roughly thirty six thousand dollars. That's it. Okay, thirty six thousand dollars. The city's not receiving. If, however, we assume there's an increasing tax base or increasing yep. valuations, the total amount the city uh, doesn't receive is sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. So twenty four thousand over fifteen years. Again, using these numbers, which the mayor and I both agree are not. Uh, are I not hear exact. that. Okay. What you're talking about to me is diagonal. Okay. We can say today, we value this project to the tune of $60,000, not 30, the 36 that, that the 5% tip would be. We can say we value it to the tune of 60, but we don't have to say that we value it over 15 years. Okay. I, I the 15 you. years extends the risk to be much higher than 60. I don't know what it would be. Right. It's like what I'm saying is when we talk about an I just want to make sure we understand. We're talking about an extremely high risk, which is your, your language, to the city. Even if we're talking about the not conservative, but the extremely radical end of it, you know, we may be talking, I, I don't, I, whatever figure you would get from what you're saying, I don't consider that a high risk. 
I think yes, does it cost the city some money that I would rather give go into it? Yes, but I don't see this as a major risk to the city. No, Kevin. Two, two things. In, in terms of the uh, value of the TIF, uh, any increase, given that the CPA money is a fixed amount for the period, and so any incremental uh, percent is going to in, in your description uh, uh, is, is coming out of the city, but it's an opportunity cost. The city is also, if there is an increased valuation, generating genuine additional income. Right? So it, it's maybe not quite as great an increase because the percentage of, of taxation um, has in, uh, that, it, that is foregoing has increased, but the absolute dollars are genuinely getting larger assuming the, the increased valuation. Um, so that um, I agree. we have to keep in perspective that this is not an out-of-pocket out of cost to the city. And the only reason those incremental dollars would be coming there is because of the, the valuation would be going up. And that would be going up um, in, in a way that's beneficial to the city in terms of absolute dollar income. Yes. The second the second item is that having also had a, a current uh, a family member in a place that looks like that in another state. Uh, the, it's uh, nearly $7,000 a month um, that several of us are having to come up with now that that uh, uh, elderly person has run out of money. And um, so in the grand scale of things, you take 40 of those units uh, for people in this community uh, to avoid having to uh, come up with that. This seems a very low cost opportunity for the city to spend money quite well. Clarify who's voting. Who votes here tonight? I don't vote. Who does vote? I'm a non-voting member. The four of us. I see. Okay. I mean, I, I think I just want to say for the record that I think that this is um, a slam dunk of a project, <coughs> and I think it's creative, innovative financing on the TIF front to work, partner with the CPA like this. I think it's clearly an incredible investment in our community, in the quality of life in our community for those who need and rely on assisted living to have affordable units. And what you call risk, I call sound investment. So I, I am very comfortable with the 15-year TIF. And, I'm, and as one who is really loath to give tax breaks, I mean, that's, that's the place I come from. And I, and I'm, I feel like this is smart, and it, it's smart city management, and it's a way to support an excellent project with great partnership. The, uh, Worcester, Worcester, Attleboro, Barber, uh, they received tips from those also? We did, yeah. Did. Uh, substantial tips. Some at, 80, some at over 80%. Yeah. Okay. The, we've all talked about corporate welfare. <coughs> which is that we know we've all said no. And uh, this is, not, I, 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 I don't look at this like Coca Cola. I don't look at it like Cole Morgan. Right. Um, which were both 13-year 13, 13 tiffs, I would just add. Those were both 13-year tiffs. Right. So, but this is all. But this this is written in somewhere in a in the deed in a uh, transfer. You know, if you if you build this and sell it, we can't. This has to this has to stay a low-income housing tax credit assisted living community. It's a condition of the tax credits. Of getting the tax yeah. credits in our regulatory agreement that we have with the Department of Housing and Community Development. I just had to hear you say it. Sure. Okay. I, <laughs> because of the because of the, the, the low income sure. element of this, I'm inclined to support it. Thank you. Um, but I really have a tough time with tax breaks. I really have a tough time with them all the time. Anywhere else, whether it's risk or call it risk or something, call it sound investment, call it whatever you want. Um, and it is, and like Mr. Lake said, it's not an out of pocket expense. It's an expense that we'll collect something on. I mean, what if that lot sat there vacant for the next 15 years? That's my concern. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, and I do have some issues with some things that happen up there at the, the hill in general, but. I, I, I'm going to support this. Thank you. So, yes. Is it a question? Is it a question that will pop? Well, the question, what I was seeking from you is, 
the typical way that we've done TIFs is a resolution comes to the council from the mayor and the um, and Edlou. And, Edlou. and it basically it's a standard kind of a language. And what it says, and I'll read it to you. It says, whereas the proposed Grantham Group, well, I can actually give you copies. I've made <coughs> copies of what it looks like. Um, but the basically basic, saying that we, the we basic concept is that, that you support it and that you would. Um, This says that, uh, so whereas the proposed Grantham Group meets the requirements of 402 CMR 2.103, uh, and then again, it, it uses the same language that is consistent with the village at Hospital Hill Economic Opportunity Area, the project will not overburden infrastructure and utilities, and the project has a reasonable chance of increasing employment opportunities for residents of Northampton. Uh, this is all the same language that we have to put in all of these, and then it spells out the actual agreement, which then I, I then execute and implement with them. Um, and then, of course, the final piece is a requirement. We have to submit it to the Mass Economic Assistance Coordinating Council. So if you read all of our other TIFs that we did, this is all you know, remove the, pro you know, switch the project and put in the different titles. And this is the, the magic words that we have to have on the uh, resolution. So we're voting to accept to, to Basically, you would be voting to recommend this. And then, the, then it would go forward to council as being recommended by the mayor and the Edwin committee. And again, we're kind of using, I'm using the process we use traditionally. We may, we may have a conversation about whether that makes sense now that the mayor is no longer going to be a member of the Edwin committee. This may be a remnant of that, but I was trying to follow the existing process. So what we, do, we don't even have a, I need a motion. I can, for, I I can put a motion on the table support, before we call a question. I would move to recommend this resolution. Okay. The council. Do I hear a second? I want a second. I would like to ask First, I need to, let's get a second to get the question out there. So, so for the sake of the discussion. Yeah. I'll second. Okay. Now you have a question. Yeah, I'd like to. It, it says, I'm reading it here, it's not going to overburden the city's infrastructure and utilities. The storm system at Hospital Hill, yeah. does, that drain, does that drain right down into the river? It does. It does. Sure, yeah, it does. They have their own detention facilities on the campus. Yeah, there's two on the north campus at this point with, I think, more proposed for future development. And so the overall health of that entire system, is it, okay. can you rate it? Um, it's new, so I think it's it's well done. Um, it's designed to handle um, unnecessary storm events, so I don't see an issue with that. Um, as part of the... Um, NEPA process, each time a large phase of development moves forward, they have to reassure the city, as it's built out, that our utility infrastructure will support the future development. So they've done that twice so far in the past um, 10 to 12 years. So there's, there's, no open, water drain. there's no open drainage that you're dumping water onto private property. It's all enclosed out. systems. And it's energy. all enclosed. And it's either going into the, it's all goes to Mill River. So there's one on the south campus, there's at least two currently on the north campus. There's also um, underground infiltration systems in place up there also. So they're recharging the ground water. Okay, thank you. The contention basins are quite large. Yeah, okay, thank you. Any other further discussion? Yeah, I just, I just want to reiterate a few, just a few points. As long as they're not redundant. Oh, <clears throat> can I just say what I said before? Yes, you can summarize. Which is that any, the longer the time frame on a tip, the, the higher the, the higher the chance that the city will lose out on a lot of income. We can have a discussion, like you said, or we can we can affirm that we care about uh, the job creation and affordable housing much higher than the hundred twenty thousand dollars the CPA is willing to grant, or the or the thirty five that that the city would over the projected 15 years, we could raise it to 60 or 75. My objection is a 15-year TIF of that magnitude, especially since, well, it looks really good right now because the CPA is underwriting a large portion of it. But the CPA will not be underwriting that on the 15th year. So it's, it's, an, it's an investment that's true. I think we should front load it so that we don't, because we don't know what the city loses 
in year 12 through 15 or 10 through 15. That's why I'm voting against this, and I would be out voting. Any other comments? Agenda item is on the proposal to rezone a section of Bridge Road from, uh, and it would be rezoned from rural residential to urban residential B. And to summarize, I think some of the questions that came up last time, the reason why we invited the, B, uh, the BPW to be here is to answer questions about the stormwater uh, and the potential stormwater uh, hazards that might result. And that's why we have. Um, so I'm just going to open this to any questions by the counselors and then, and I know that there are some residents here who may also want to speak again. I'm trying to not have the, again, if we need to take a vote and, and Councilor Schwartz needs to leave at 6.15, we were all here last time, so if we could keep this kind of, if there's new, new things that are coming up, that'd be great to uh, bring them forth. If you could quickly summarize some of the old things, that would be helpful. But, I'm going to open it right away to counselors to continue in discussion. So, Councilor Tacey, do you have a question? Well, uh, one couple things I want to say about okay. it. Okay. Um, this is the Lathrop community. This is the new assisted or, uh, facility. And there's a huge difference between this and the last one we just listened to. This, this water that is generated from this new facility, this new construction project, the roofs, the parking lots all will generate more runoff. Will not percolate into the ground like does at this point. It's going to generate more runoff. The runoff is something that we, that this will dump onto private property, directly on private property. It's open. It's not contained. It is, uh, and if I understand it correctly, the peak flow will not be allowed to change, but it will be able to remain at that peak flow for longer periods of time. So if it erodes over a period of four hours, and you run it for eight hours, it will erode twice as much on private property. Councilor Spector and I, along with Councilor Adams on the Board of Public Works Conference Committee, we are charged with somehow finding a way to find out how to pay for stormwater management and upgrades to whatever it is that we need in the city for stormwater. And it seems that our infrastructure is always behind our zone. We have to go out to the public and try and sell them on a stormwater, either an enterprise fund or some way to pay for stormwater, whether it's in their tax bill somehow or whatever it is. And I'm not too keen at this point on doing this rezoning now, even though when they have to change, when they have to come up with a design criteria that meets the needs of that site. They don't have to take into consideration what's down downhill. And that's my problem. So I we've seen it happen before, and I would very much like to see our stormwater, our, our infrastructure be managed first before we create any more development, because then if you get the public, then we're going to try and sell the stormwater. B2 is going to be a little irate and say, well, Jesus, you're putting more and more and more, and you haven't yet taken care of what you got yet, what, what you already have. So anyway, I'll stop and we'll go on. Thank you. I just have a, I have a question. I need to try to understand this. And th I do recall that I, I think I had to leave early at the last meeting. I apologize. So, um, so my apologies if this is ground that's already been covered. But um, uh, 
there's the zoning issue, and then there is the stormwater drainage issue. And, I, and I, I'm trying to understand why we, we wouldn't be looking at the zoning issue as a zoning issue, and then defer to the planning board around the building and the constructing and the drainage issue. Because do I understand correctly that for us to vote to approve the zoning change is not the end of the line for them, right? I mean, they have to go through a whole process of approval and review and plan design. And is there, I don't know where to put my eyes on this. Can I, yes, can I ask a yeah. clarificatory question? Uh, yeah. Can I clarify one question? <laughs> uh, what I was hoping, I'm very happy that uh, Mr. Huntley is here at, today because I think he can illuminate for us what kinds of um, uh, hurdles the Lathrop community would have to go through to get a stormwater permit um, regarding any, any development or specifically regarding this new property. Is that possible that you can give us a, a short synopsis of sure. storm, your stormwater management permit? Sure. Um, process in your stormwater permit? Basically, any disturbance over an acre in size requires permits from the city and the EPA. And basically, it's a notice of intent is what it is and what you're going to be doing. I think the planning board really holds the key there, the fact that they're going to require, you know, basically a site plan review. They're going to require that pre- and post-development flows for stormwater match. Uh, Councilor Tacey said it earlier, uh, the peaks will remain the same, but the flow duration will be longer. So that would be something I've looked at. I did some research for that whole vicinity of that watershed and the development since happened since 1965. Um, what I did is I looked at the 1965 topographic maps that we have and then looked at the development that happened around there. And I got six bullet points to talk about. Uh, the first one, there's about 12 acres of forest removed as part of the St. Mary's Cemetery expansion. I think that was done in the 1990s to early 2000s at some point. I really don't know the exact year it was done, but 12 acres is a lot of land to remove all the forest habitat or uh, canopy from and have it just free flow. Uh, development of Emily Lane happened in 86 to 88. Uh, the street drainage flows into that Peter Brook, and they have no detention facilities up there on Emily Lane. So anything that comes off the street is just free flowing into this Peter Brook. Uh, the development of Pines End Drive in the early 1990. I uh, did a review of the drainage report, and the way they got through without having detention facilities was that the lower watershed peak flow goes through before this upper one hits, and therefore no mitigation was done because the peak flow had already passed before this additional peak flow came in. Uh, development of the Lathrop community in 88. I'm not sure of the construction timeline after the approval. Did it take two years to build out or five years to build out? But um, they have stormwater controls for pre and post development designed for 10 and 100 year events with no increase in peak flow. Uh, we had development of the, what I call the former Northampton nursing home. We believe it was constructed in about 1970, but we have no plans on file. We did find one plan on file, though, excuse me, that in 2005 that shows all their catch basins on their property flow to a common pipe to Hatfield Street, and that's pipe uh, enters down by uh, back of Steve Susco's house across from Cotton's driveway. And there's no detention on that site either. And then, um, in general, our city storm systems are, are designed to handle a 10-year storm event, which is about two and a half plus inches of rain over a 24-hour period. Um, one of the <coughs> things that you're seeing lately is that we've had a real change in weather patterns in the past four to five years. Um, Instead of 35 inches of rain a year, we're seeing 50 plus inches of rain a year. We're also seeing deluges come in. Uh, look at August in 2010, we had two inches of rain in two hours come in. And these kind of storms are almost unheard of that we've never been a customer. We don't design to either. Um, as far as going forward, like I said, as far as, you know, if, it, if a development project come, would, did come in, there'd be some local permitting from the, uh, the federal and through uh, DPW. There will probably be some conditions from the Conservation Commission if they're doing a discharge to a brook or a wetland. Uh, DPW would do a review of capacity needs, uh, infrastructure, water, sewer, drain, uh, highway capacity, things of that nature. And one of the things that we would be looking at was to make sure this peak flow matched. Um, the infrastructure of that vicinity is predominantly through uh, closed drainage systems on Bridge Road and Partial <coughs> Hatfield Street. 
and the rest of it's open flow through brooks um, that flow down to Cook Avenue. And once it goes underneath Cook Avenue, it is enclosed all on private property by private interests, and then goes underneath the interstate system and flows to the Connecticut River. So the bottom line choke, choke point in our system is the culvert under uh, Cook Avenue. That would be our choke point, and that's a, I believe it's a 36 inch culvert. Uh, we don't have records when it was installed, but I know it was extended in 1962 as part of a roadway project uh, with new wind walls put on it. Uh, the culvert under Hatfield Street is a 30-inch culvert. Again, I don't have a record when that was installed. Um, the only problem we had with that was in the April Nor'easter of 2007, where it clogged with debris and, and came over the road and washed out part of Hatfield Street. It seemed to survive the um, August 2011 uh, Hurricane Irene just fine. And like I said, that's a 30-inch culvert there. Um, engineers can design a lot of different things, but uh, it doesn't take the fact that it could be causing erosion downstream to uh, personal property as you've got these uh, longer duration flows or uh, flows that we don't design for under standard engineering practices. Yes? Um, I, I didn't, but I... I do have something to say. Go ahead. Uh, in, in the Conservation Commission, we are occasionally in the position of uh, looking at systems that have been properly permitted according to the existing regulations, and yet uh, we are of the opinion that it will cause uh, uh, detriment downstream. It's flowing into a system that, uh, as uh, Councilor Tacey said, yeah, the peak may not have gone up, but the duration has gone up, and so the net impact on some downstream okay. area has gone up. And we don't exactly have the regulatory tools with which to say, oh no, here's what you got to do, here's the conditions you would have to meet. So we're, we're then sort of inventing um, solutions rather than living within articulated uh, regulatory um, uh, structures. And we have sometimes done that, but I prefer not to have the Conservation Commission put in the position of having to invent uh, things or disregard the downstream damage. And so, uh, I, uh, yes, if this uh, uh, zoning change were to happen, there would be still, uh, uh, in answer to uh, Councilor Schwartz's question, there would still be a series of uh, uh, all the normal applications before any work could be done. But that problem of whether the existing regulatory constraints through which those applications would be reviewed are adequate to dealing with the impacts is an open question. I, I didn't right, that's, and that's, I'm sorry, Go ahead. Mr. Chair, that's what I really want to deal with at a meeting like this. Um, because it, uh, I think that, especially in, in, in my ward and, and in other, other wards as well, we have an issue of zoning. Stripping infrastructure, and uh, at, the, at, the, at the final and highest legislative body in the city, we really have to make sure that our regulations are able to accommodate um, this, the, these kinds of impacts. And uh, I'm curious if the Conservation Commission has, if, if, if the lessons learned at the Conservation Commission have uh, policy implications. And I'm, I'm also curious regarding. Uh, Regarding the Department of Public Works, whether uh, the stormwater permit is, uh, I mean, as we can see, as you, as you just outlined, um, Mr. Huntley, the, the stormwater permitting was, um, was uh, didn't happen, let's say, on a, on, a, on, a, on a couple of those projects that you listed. And part of that's because we didn't have them, right? Is that right? Part of the, we didn't, we weren't mandated to do those kinds of uh, reviews. I'm not aware of the subdivision rules and regulations that were in place in the right. 1980s, um, early 90s. I came to the city in the year 2000, so I really don't know that. Right. So, so we, we do. I'm not. I'm not trying to lay blame on any department. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying that, um, as you said, engineers can str can structure things all sorts of ways, and some of the ways they structure them can kind of avoid <coughs> having to having it. More, having to have more detention ponds or having to have more underground facilities and, and I think we want to be uh, rather um, cognizant
cognizant and about uh, about our our stormwater permit. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also I'm glad you're here also because I don't know if you really can speculate at, you know on the spot, but I wonder if, if you feel as though our um, stormwater permitting process is uh, is, is adequate to protect uh, things like a road. 